Good afternoon, Hoosiers. Thank you for joining Dr. Box and Dr. Sullivan and myself. Um, and also thank you for everyone that tuned in yesterday evening. I discussed a roadmap forward for the state of Indiana and for our people. And just to very quickly, before we get to Dr. Box and Dr. Sullivan, um, recap just a few of the highlights from yesterday evening, if you were unable to join us. Um, our statewide mask mandate will become an advisory on April 6th. Masks will still be required in all state buildings and state facilities at all vaccination and um, sites and all COVID testing um, sites. We don't want those to um, be jeopardized uh, for folks who are most at risk, who may be going to do the right thing. Um, on March 31st, we plan to open eligibility to get vaccinated to all 16 or older. That's again on March 31st, so the last day of this month. Uh, our current capacity restrictions will become a localized um, driven decision. We'll still be providing all the county metrics and updates and um, whether or not the positivity rate is increasing or decreasing in your um, neighborhood and your home county to local officials to make those data driven decisions themselves. So this is local government, local health departments um, determining those venue um, and capacity restrictions that are that are appropriate for those um, each in each individual county. Also schools will continue to operate under the current restrictions and requirements for the remainder of this school year. Um, we have experienced because of COVID-19, because of the pandemic, some learning loss and we don't wanna, um, we don't wanna continue that. And so we'll play through this for the next couple months while um, kids are coming together in these congregate um, gatherings and, and make sure that we're continuing those, um, those guidelines at our schools for the 2021-2022 school year. I said last night also that it was not just my hope, but it was my expectation, and that's just what it is, an expectation. Uh, but schools will be able to open in person during the next school year. So we need to do all that we can, make sure the schools have all the resources that includes vaccine, but a lot of other resources as well to make those safe decisions for themselves and for the for their customers, the kiddos that are getting a good education in each and every one of our schools. We're also um, probably as we speak, it may have already happened, we'll know by the end of today, um, but we're on the cusp of yet another major milestone um, here in Indiana. And that means to us, we're going to celebrate, quite frankly, I will at least, um, vaccinating our one millionth Hoosier fully. So whether that's a two dose to the arm or a one dose J and J, we'll hit today one million. May have already done it already, but we'll have that by the end of the day, uh, the most up to date number, but one million. So we are not just on the road to recovery, we're onward and upward. Uh, and we would just continue to appeal, and that's why it's so encouraging that we continue to be able to um, open up the eligibility to more and more Hoosiers, and that Hoosiers are taking not just us up on it, but the vaccine up on what it, what it means to the state remaining open and growing. Also, uh, another bit of good news, uh, we will we, we've come off a series of very successful mass vaccination sites. I have another one up in South Bend. This weekend, all have proven, whether it was in Gary or Sellersburg or Indianapolis earlier, all have proven to be very successful. I think it's maybe because it's convenient or people just schedule it for the weekend, um, go together. But we're going to be starting on April 1st for 16 days we'll have another mass vaccination site at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway again. And we think we'll be able to do over the course of those days about 96,000 vaccinations at the IMS. So 
kudos to Indiana Health, who will be running point. And uh, obviously, we had you, you mentioned we had about 300 staff at the IMS the first time. Um, IU Health is going to be running the show. Providing all the clinicians, putting shots in arms. It's just incredible. So we want to obviously thank uh, IU Health for taking that on. But then, you know, they'll be the lead clinician, and and like you say, just wouldn't be able to do without them. And so thank you to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Thank you to IU Health. Thank you to the Indiana National Guard, who will be helping as well. So yet another uh, milestone that we continue to build upon. And their being there allows us to be other places. That's exactly so right. Important. Mobile units, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And with that, Dr. Boxer in the pole position, so drive on. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thanks, Governor. Good afternoon, Hoosiers. When we look at where we started this journey a year ago, it's incredible to realize that in a week's time, any Hoosier age 16 and older who wants a COVID-19 vaccine will be able to sign up to get their shot. Opening vaccine to every eligible Hoosier is a huge undertaking, but it's an important step that will bring us closer to the finish line in this pandemic. Nearly 1.7 million Hoosiers have already helped us along that path by receiving at least one dose of vaccine. That represents 32% of our population age 16 and older. As of last night, nearly 993,000 Hoosiers were fully vaccinated, up from nearly 870,000 last week. This means that nearly 19% of Hoosiers for whom the vaccine is authorized have received either two doses of a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or a single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. When we look at a vaccine uptake by age, we find that nearly 73% of Hoosiers age 80 plus have scheduled or received a vaccine. 76% of those age 70 to 79 have done so. More than 64% of those 60 to 69 are getting vaccinated. 45% of those ages 50 to 59 are in line or have gotten their first dose. And 29% of those ages 40 to 49 have signed up. These numbers also include nearly 148,000 first and second doses administered to residents and staff in long-term care. While the numbers are, are cause for celebration and we've helped enable Indiana to ease some of the restrictions that have been, placed now, been in place now for months, I wanna caution Hoosiers that this pandemic is far from over. We're still seeing new cases of COVID each and every day and we're watching what's happening in Europe with the B117 variant closely. More than 1.4 million Hoosiers under the age of 16 are not eligible because none of these three vaccines have been authorized for younger people. While I hope that the current clinical trials in children ages 12 to 17 result in an expansion of eligibility for those groups sometime this summer, it's unrealistic to think that children under the age of 12 will be eligible for vaccine for quite some time. That means that it's imperative that for every eligible adult in their household that they get vaccinated if they can, because that is how we can help protect our youngest Hoosiers. For those Hoosiers and for the people I love, I will continue to wear my mask and follow the CDC's recommendations for social distancing, hand washing, and I will encourage my family and friends to do the same. I am grateful to have had a mask mandate for eight months, including the 12 weeks after we made Hoosiers age 70 and older eligible for the vaccine. Nearly 78% of COVID deaths in Indiana occurred in people age 70 and older. By the time the mask mandate is lifted, we will have had a mandate for five weeks after those age 50 and older become eligible. Our priority has always been to protect those most likely to become severely ill or die from COVID, and age is the highest contributing factor. The mandatory wearing of masks has protected those who are most vulnerable while allowing them ample time to be vaccinated. Nearly 70% of Hoosiers over age 65 have been vaccinated, which is above the national average. Please keep wearing your masks. We know it works. And we have seen that in our extremely low, we've seen this with our extremely low influenza rates this season. The science behind masks has not changed and choosing to wear a mask will continue to protect you and others as we work to get more Hoosiers vaccinated. This process will take time. While we're receiving 38,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine this week and have seen an overall increase in vaccine, many Hoosiers are still scheduling appointments several weeks out. We have spaced out appointments around the state to give people options for scheduling and to ensure that we do not have sites overbooked. 
We never want a person to show up for a vaccine and have no doses available to them. But we know that it can be frustrating to have to wait and that not everyone can travel to find an earlier appointment. Please be patient. There will be a vaccine for everyone who wants one. To make sure that sooner rather than later, be willing to take the first vaccine that you can get. Each one of the three vaccines is highly effective at preventing hospitalizations and death. If you're waiting on a particular brand, such as Johnson & Johnson, which remains very limited, your wait may be extended. Our team continues to look at vaccine allocations across the state and is working to direct our doses in a way that ensures access to all Hoosiers in the most reasonable time frame possible. We look at county population and current vaccine inventory when allocating doses. We also look at the number of vaccine clinics in a county, identify which sites are fully booked for a prolonged period, and determine which sites have the capacity to increase their throughput. We also overlay our social vulnerability index to ensure that we are reaching our most vulnerable populations. This weekend, we'll be at the University of Notre Dame to administer up to 5,760 doses on Friday and Saturday. All of those appointments are booked, and we have three mobile units in Floyd, Tippecanoe, and Elkhart counties to help increase availability in those counties. Those are also full. We will be in other counties in the coming weeks as our vaccine supplies permit and plan to offer additional mass vaccination sites as soon as our supplies allow us to do so. And as the governor mentioned, we are incredibly excited to be partnering with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and IU Health to open another mass vaccination clinic at IMS next week. That clinic will offer the single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine and will run for 16 days throughout the month of April. Appointments will open later this afternoon. We plan to be open from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. on the following dates, April 1st through the 3rd, April 13th through the 18th, and April 24th through the 30th. Our goal is to vaccinate as many as 6,000 people per day at IMS. This wouldn't be possible without these partners, specifically IU Health, which is the lead clinician on site and providing dozen of, dozens of vaccinators who will be administering the doses, and IMS, which is so graciously hosting us again. Our Indiana National Guard, as always, the soldiers will be there answering our call once again. Please keep in mind that only people age 18 and older have been approved to receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine when you are scheduling. We realize that Hoosiers who will be eligible when this clinic opens aren't yet able to register for those appointments at this site. Please remember that we still want our highest risk people who are eligible now to get the soonest appointments and that we are also adding appointments, locations, and more mass vaccination sites across the state. We are also working on plans to distribute vaccine directly to large business and industry partners. This work began in February when we engaged a small working group of business and industry partners to develop a playbook that could be used to plan for workplace clinics when vaccine is more widely available. We will have much more to come on this as plans are finalized. Our goal is, be, is to begin providing vaccine to those employers that have indicated an ability to vaccinate their staff in April and then expand further to all industry types sometime in May. As we continue to focus on vaccine allocation and administration, we will also continue to monitor cases and hospitalizations closely. In addition, we are committed to supporting and maintaining testing capacity around the state because testing remains a critical piece of the puzzle as we navigate this pandemic, especially as new variants emerge. To date, Indiana has reported 73 cases of the B117 variant from the UK, which has taken hold in Europe and is more infectious than we have dealt with for the past year. This bears watching as we have seen a slight increase in our positivity rate since last week. It now stands at 3.3%, up from 3.1% last week. It's encouraging to see the number of Hoosiers hospitalized with COVID remain at their lowest levels since late June. The number of Hoosiers currently hospitalized with symptoms of COVID was just under 600 yesterday. This is a significant drop from the nearly 3,500 who were hospitalized back in December. Hospital admissions for COVID have fallen to fewer than 60 a day, which is an incredible improvement from, from the more than 500 per day we saw in late November and early December. Our color-coded county maps also continue to look good. The number of counties in blue on our two metric map has risen once again to 66 this week. 25 counties are in yellow and one is in orange. 
Our advisory map, which indicates the level of restrictions that counties must follow, shows just one county in orange for the second straight week and no counties in red. 57 counties are now at the blue advisory level, up from 55 last week. 34 counties are in yellow, and one is an orange advisory level. Back in, on January the 11th, we had 73 counties in a red level on both the county metrics map and the advisory map, and no counties in blue. You can see how much the pendulum has swung back in our favor. favor. By keeping these numbers moving in the right direction, we can help prevent further losses to families around the state. At the height of the winter surge, we reported more than 120 deaths in a single day. Today, we reported 15 new deaths, which brings our total lives lost to 12,975 when you include both confirmed and clinically diagnosed deaths. We will continue to grieve for those Hoosiers and work to honor them by doing everything possible to get vaccines in arms of eligible Hoosiers as quickly as possible. I also want Hoosiers to know that we are working with hospitals around the state to open up their visitation policies. Our hospitals have been wonderful partners throughout this pandemic and have taken many steps to protect their patients and their staff. One of these steps was to restrict visitation so that the risk of exposure was reduced. Now that our numbers have improved, we have worked with the Indiana Hospital Association and hospitals to encourage more normal visitation practices so long as conditions permit. We know that patients' mental and physical well-being improve when they're able to visit with loved ones in person, not just over a mobile device. And our hope is that increased visitation will lead to a quicker recovery for Hoosiers who are currently hospitalized. Finally, I wanna provide my heartfelt thanks to all of the partners who have hosted us for mass vaccination clinics this month. As you know, we started at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Then we went to Ivy Tech in Sellersburg. Last weekend, we went, had the honor of partnering with Lake Ridge Schools in Gary to administer nearly 2,100 vaccines during a two-day clinic at Calumet New Tech High School. The outpouring of support in Gary was incredible. Dr. Sharon Johnson Shirley and her team truly rolled out the red carpet, and we were were reminded many times that these vaccine clinics are about much, much more than getting shots in arms. They're about giving hope back to communities, and sometimes they're even about helping an eighth grader with a paper on a health topic, which one of our staff took the time to do. We're looking forward to our clinic at the University of Notre Dame this weekend and to additional opportunities to sow the seeds of hope for all Hoosiers. Thank you. And with that, uh, Dr. Sullivan, Jen, you've got some updates on um, progress that we've made in terms of vaccinating disabled Hoosiers, homeless Hoosiers, homebound Hoosiers, and also um, some updates on our two-on-one service. Governor, thank you for the opportunity to update the state on several important initiatives. At the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration, our goal is to support the state through the public health emergency and recovery by helping our most vulnerable residents with any support they need. One of our top priorities is access to vaccination. On a personal note, my husband and I had the opportunity to be vaccinators at Calumet New Tech High School in Gary last weekend. I can't tell you what a joy it was to see the community volunteers, Department of Health, and National Guard come together to immunize over 2,000 Hoosiers. At FSSA, one of the many groups we serve and support is the state's residents with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Many of these Hoosiers live together in congregate settings. Our Division of Disability and Rehabilitative Services is collaborating with the Department of Health to vaccinate these Hoosiers. To achieve this, we've partnered with Walgreens, as well as eight community-based providers to vaccinate approximately 4,000 individuals. I'm happy to report that this week, we will begin second doses for this entire population. Unlike many states, we also included the direct service providers caring for these individuals in the health workforce vaccine eligibility. One of our providers told us about a nurse who, when arriving with a tote full of vaccines at one group home in Indianapolis, was greeted to an ovation from a cheering group of residents. They were grateful for the opportunity to get their vaccine and the ability to try to resume a more normal life. Our team and the Department of Health also collaborated to help individuals with disabilities receiving home and community-based services. We are actively assisting individuals to secure a personalized scheduling link to schedule their appointment. If you, a family member or a friend, are receiving a Medicaid waiver and have questions about your appointment, you may contact your case manager 
or call 211 to confirm whether you have been entered in the special populations portal. Indiana has an estimated 5,500 Hoosiers experiencing homelessness who rely on congregate emergency shelters. Many of these individuals also have underlying medical conditions that place them at higher risk for severe illness or death with COVID. FSSA and the Department of Health have matched these shelters across the state with their local health department, hospital, or federally qualified health center to provide vaccinations to those experiencing homelessness. This approach includes on-site and mobile vaccinations. So far, in the first 10 days of this program, it is responsible for vaccinating 724 housing insecure Hoosiers. One great example of this amazing partnership is in Vanderburg County, where Ascension St. Vincent partnered with multiple homeless shelters to vaccinate nearly 160 individuals on the program's first weekend in operation. Another vulnerable group of Hoosiers we are making special efforts to reach are those who are confined to their homes for various reasons. The Hoosier Homebound Portal connects homebound Hoosiers to their local health departments and emergency medical personnel who come to their homes to vaccinate them. We want to thank the state's area agencies on aging for taking in requests from Hoosiers who would like to request an at-home vaccination. So far, more than 3,400 individuals are entered in the portal from 90 of Indiana's 92 counties. We spoke with Chief Jason Moore of the City of Bloomington Fire Department. He is personally going out on most of the runs. Chief Moore told us one, of Bloom one Bloomington woman who thanked him profusely for bringing the vaccine to her as she has not been out of her house for a year. She said, this is more than a vaccine, it is a shot of freedom. Indiana 211 expanded its normal operations to add a new specialized call center specifically trained to answer questions from Hoosiers about COVID-19 vaccinations and help with scheduling or rescheduling appointments to get vaccinated. To date, the 211 COVID-19 vaccination information and scheduling line has answered over 810,000 calls and scheduled and rescheduled over 290,000 appointments. If necessary, this team will reach out to you and your neighbors too. They have made over 53,000 outbound calls to assist with rescheduling appointments. To put this in perspective, 211 usually handles about 20,000 calls a month. We answered that many yesterday. Our team is proud to report that they continually receive positive feedback from people who are so thankful, especially those who are not comfortable using computers or do not have internet access. One Hoosier emailed the team a note of thanks where he explained that he and his wife are 60 to 64 in the age group and initially signed up for appointments in their home county that were weeks down the road. Well, like many Hoosiers, they've become familiar with the ability to look around for vaccinations in nearby counties. When they found an appointment that was only days away and not weeks, they got some help from 211 to cancel the original appointments and reschedule. I'd also like to update you on some major initiatives that aren't related to the vaccine effort, but are just as important to the people they're helping. Indiana 211 is also supporting the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority to help Hoosiers fill out applications for the Indiana Emergency Rental Assistance Program. This is the program that's designed to decrease evictions, increase housing stability, and prevent homelessness by providing eligible renters with up to 12 months of rental assistance and or utility or home energy assistance as well. So far, the team at 211 dedicated to emergency rental assistance has answered 4,186 calls. Indiana renters in need of assistance should call 211 or visit www.indianahousingnow.org for more de details and to apply. In July, we also called on the team at 211 to stand up the Be Well Crisis Helpline to support the mental health needs of Hoosiers. Anyone in Indiana can simply call 211 24 hours a day to, to talk to an experienced and compassionate counselor specifically trained to help with the issues that have come along with this pandemic. In January, in the depths of winter, the Be Well Crisis Helpline saw its busiest month, answering just under 2,000 calls or about 64 calls a day. In total to date, the team has answered 10,624 calls. The top issues Hoosiers are calling to discuss are isolation and withdrawal, anxiety or fearfulness, and issues with sleep. More than half of all callers have received a referral for additional mental health or substance use services or requested additional crisis counseling. One of our recent callers wanted to express his appreciation for the support of our 211 team. His wife passed away two weeks ago. 
He currently has COVID and is quarantining in a hotel away from his family who is in town for the funeral. He's called 211 a few times and said he doesn't know what he would do without the support he's received from his fellow Hoosiers on the other end of the line during this time of grief. And finally, let's talk about kids. This pandemic has impacted them so much, especially their school routines. For children who rely on their school for nutrition, it can be critically important, but there's help. Pandemic Electronic Benefits Transfer, or PEBT, is a federal program for students who have lost access to free or reduced price school meals due to school closures or virtual learning. Families of these children are receiving Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program benefits on an EBT card to fill this gap. As of last month, over $330 million in PEBT funding has been issued in Indiana and planning for the summer is underway. We're so proud to partner for these efforts and thank you to Governor Holcomb for allowing me to update you on these issues today. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Rachel, with that, we'll go right to the Q&A. Casey Smith with the Associated Press. Good afternoon, Casey. Good afternoon. Uh, my question's for Dr. Box. Um, I, we've been talking to some medical experts um, and they've said that they believe it might be too soon to lift the mask mandate with it possibly being several weeks or even a couple a couple um, months past April 6th before we have a high percentage of Indiana residents who are considered fully immunized. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. So my thoughts are is, is that the science remains the same, whether, we're, whether it's called a mask mandate or it's called a mask advisory, Hoosiers know what the science shows. We have made it very clear and we've been doing that for the most part across the state wearing our masks to prevent the spread of this, of this virus to other individuals and prevent ourselves from becoming infected. Social distancing, washing our hands, staying home when we're sick, those mitigation measures do not change. I am very blessed that we've had a mask mandate for eight months now. Really, we will have had the mask mandate in place for almost five weeks uh, for 50 and older. And when we looked at that data, we know that that shows us that that, that actually gets us to about 98% of the deaths that we saw in the state of Indiana and over 80% of the hospitalizations. We also have been working very hard to make sure that our individuals with comorbidities have been included and that we have um, sent out already 148,000 links to individuals from our portal so that they can have a special sign up link uh, to get the vaccine earlier. We have also worked very, very hard to make sure that we've messaged this to our disability community and allowed them to sign up. So I think that we have things well underway. We have 40 and older, and we know that when we get to the 40 and older population, that according to the Regan Streif data that we pulled, that includes about 91% of Hoosiers with comorbidities. So I think we're positioned very well as long as we continue, as you say, to wear these masks and practice those social mitigation measures that the science has clearly shown work. And I would say, Casey, you didn't ask me, but I'll give you my answer. <laughs> to the same question. One, that is, as Dr. Box said, I won't repeat everything, but um, we, we have let data drive our decisions um, since day one. I said that last night. The, the reality on the ground is what we look at, and there's not one single um, piece of information that drives that decision. There's many, and as Dr. Box said, that um, our progress that we've made on the vaccination front is um, comforting, but it's far from over as you allude to, but we're also in a different place in addition to having gotten to 40 year olds or 50 year olds, now 40 year olds, but really 50 year olds for the last five weeks. We also are in a much different place in terms of our resources to care for those who are in need, much different than eight months ago in terms of available doctors, staff, ICU beds, all these things that you mentioned. Ventilators, remember when we were talking about <sighs> ventilators? I mean, so PPE. much much different place in terms of resources to care for those who are most in need, hospitalization rates, deaths, et cetera. We're also in a different place than we were in the beginning in terms of our ability to test and trace. We're still doing that. We haven't pulled back on testing sites. No. Other states have drawn down maybe or other places around the world we've not and so we'll continue to be able to test and trace and then that positivity rate is as we talked about 
a little bit earlier. We, I, I look at, you know, where on the slope are we? Has it plateaued? Where have we been? And over the last, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 days, it's been three, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, below five. So we are in a different place. This is by no means, Casey, a mission accomplished moment. This is a proceed with caution. This is a um, absolutely a time to uh, take it onward and upward. Perge, as they say in, in Latin, you know, persist and proceed and go forward. And we can do that. And Hoosiers know what works, as Dr. Vox said. Hoosiers know what works, and we'll continue to lead by example. Mark Bennett, the Terre Haute Tribune Star. Hello, Mark. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor and Dr. Vox. Appreciate your time very much. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Dr. Vox. Um, I would wonder with uh, K through 12 schools around the state entering spring break time, mm. what your concerns are about that with uh, many intending to leave the state, go south into some hotspot destinations, and then come back. Uh, I, I wonder what your concerns are and, and what your advice to those people might be. Well, I think that's a, a very, very good point. You know, um, there are certain places that a, a lot of states where individuals like to go that have um, a higher percentage of the variants, uh, specifically the B117 variant that we actually know we've had here in Indiana now for, for many weeks. Um, so you can get infected uh, away from home as easily as you can at home. I think it's about not letting your guard down when you are in a public place or a community place. It's about wearing your mask. It's continuing those same things that you do to protect yourself and your loved ones and your community here at home when you go um, out of state. Do I have concerns about it? Yes, because past history shows us that vacations like this, um, holidays like Easter coming up are times when we do tend to see um, a spike in our cases. Um, we do know that the B117 variant is more infectious, meaning about 1.5 times more easily uh, transmissible from one person to another. There's still a little bit of a question, but may even be more serious. The good news is we do know that the vaccine does help protect against this. This does, the vaccine is good against the B117 variant. So all the more reason, as we say, as we're in this race for vaccine and variants, let's make sure we get vaccine into arms as quickly as we po possibly can for everyone. Abdul Hakim Shabazz, Indy Politics. Good afternoon, Abdul. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, one question for you and uh, for uh, Dr. Box as well. It sort of uh, ties into uh, your uh, news conference uh, media availability had uh, last week. Uh, in the year that we've uh, been experiencing with COVID-19, what have you learned the most from this whole uh, experience? That's for you and for Dr. Box. The most on a long list? <laughs> uh, data rules, uh, teamwork, is the X factor and my uh, boundless appreciation for all that Hoosiers have not just endured um, but have brought forward. It's been remarkable to watch so many different entities learn along the way, build the airplane in flight, so to speak, and start to start our descent and land this thing smoothly. Now, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a myopic outlook about this to where I'm only, again, looking at one indicator or um, predicting the future, but we are prepared to meet all of the challenges ahead. And because I say that because we've proven it over this last year in spades. I don't know if I can say it any better, but I would say that I think it has shown me how critically important public health is, mm -hmm. not just across the state of Indiana, but across the United States, and how much it, it is intertwined. And I would echo the governor's comments about the fact that I have been overwhelmed by the partnerships, not only within state government, between agencies, um, but also with our external partners across the state, um, with our other local health departments, our hospital systems, FQHCs, community health clinics, our elected officials um, have been amazing in coming together. And and I, I've been overwhelmed in talking, as I've, and I've said this before, other state health officers are like, well, how did you get them to do that? Did, you have, did the governor have to have an order to make <laughs> them set up a site? How did you get them to, did you pay them to do that? And I'm like, 
No, we just mm -hmm. asked. Yeah. And honestly, that's the way Hoosiers have re responded. And that that's what I've learned is that the Hoosier spirit and Hoosier hospitality goes very, very deep in the state. Yes. Meredith with WLFI. Good afternoon, Meredith. Good afternoon, Governor and Dr. Box. Dr. Box, I'd like to say I love your blazer, just to start off. <laughs> Thank you. I'm willing <laughs> spring to stay. <laughs> yeah, we all are. Um, so I know that during your speech last night and kind of towards the beginning of the press conference, you had mentioned that you want to make sure that the vaccine is distributed fairly and that it's getting to everyone. Yes. Are there any areas in the state of Indiana that you've noticed are a problem or that you're having issues get a proper amount of vaccine to? Yeah, you. Uh, I should probably should have added that again in the outset of my comments, um, and you might want to follow up on this. But but we will we will um, continue to lean into making access to the vaccination as easy in your daily life as we possibly can make it. And so we I referenced uh, a large employer vaccination program that we we've been working on for several weeks now. Uh, around the state of Indiana. And we hope, um, not just speaking for myself or for the male population, but we hope that that in turn employers can make it easier for folks in their normal routine or their daily life that we get more men and women um, to, to get vaccinated. And so, yes, we'll continue sending our mobile units all over the state of Indiana, almost like SWAT teams, um, getting to make sure that it's equitable and it's available. And we'll continue with our communication program. But also I think those, those large businesses, when we start to deploy in that manner here soon, um, it'll be a full court press. I think it's a, a really good point. And, and I also wanna point out that we look regularly at mapping across the entire state of where the vaccine up, what the vaccine uptake is. And we overlay that with our social vulnerability index. And we can see that in some of our rural areas, we don't have as good of uptake. We can see this in some of our uh, areas with higher social vulnerability index. Um, so that could be lower socioeconomic, minority populations. Um, and, and sometimes that's a part of it is vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's access issues. So we can definitely uh, work on both of those, solve the access issues like we did up in Lake County and Calumet. I mean, it was incredible when we just um, purposely text messaged individuals that we would be in their community and the dates we would be there and to please go to our website and sign up. I know Dr. Valilala was having trouble at, in Lake County at one of her um, vaccine sites, uh, getting enough people to sign up. We just sent text messages out to the zip codes and a concentric circles around that area and she filled her sites up immediately. So we've learned a lot in our, our work with um, our partners across the state and really know how to replicate this across the state now. Yeah, and I would just say in general, Meredith, we, you know, I at least try to take every excuse out of the um, response, meaning, and, and they're understandable, I mean, excuse is probably the wrong word, but justification for not getting vaccinated. Um, w whether you're a wait and see kind of person or you didn't know it was available or you didn't know where it was available or you couldn't get there, we're trying to, now that we have supply and continue to be told we'll get more, th thankful to our federal partners, we can plan out and we can, and we can make it more convenient um, for folks to get vaccinated. And then it just, I mean, it's, uh, it's numbers. The people that have had COVID, the people that are getting vaccinated, that gets us um, to the tail end of this pandemic. Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Afternoon, Brandon. Afternoon, Governor. Afternoon, Dr. Box. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, Governor, um, with the pressure that lawmakers have been exerting over the last certainly few weeks and few months, why should Hoosiers think it's realistic that if the situation does get worse, now that you've gotten rid of all of the restrictions, you would ever reimpose them? because we've proven over the last year that we'll let data drive our decisions. I think our track record is um, sound. I'm not driven, Brandon, by um, anything other than reality. And as I said, here's a dose of reality. We have the resources to care for those who are in need, meaning 
uh, ICU beds, doctors, et cetera. We have a vaccine, three of them, as a matter of fact, that we're very methodically deploying and, and Hoosiers are taking us up. So we're in a different place. And as we saw this thing, like a roller coaster almost, a couple surges, we've responded responsibly and reasonably. And we're in a better, different place. So judge us on our track record. But I'm not, I'm not pressured, I think was your word, um, by pundits or politics whatsoever. And then my and then my second question uh, was um, with the decision to to open the uh, vaccine eligibility to everybody um, next week. It looks like we're going to get about forty percent more doses hmm. next week, but that population goes up four hundred forty percent. Yeah. Are you creating a situation <laughs> where there's just going to be a lot of frustration? Quite frankly, that's a fair question. We've mm -hmm. we, we've we, talked about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to take it, or I so, can. So yeah. So we. We are under the belief that we will continue to get increasing doses of vaccine um, and have been told that by May we will have enough vaccine for every Hoosier in the state of Indiana. So my, our plan is to make sure that we are ready and open and that individuals that want to get vaccinated have the ability to sign up for that. Will our wait times as far as will it take rather than one week or two weeks or three weeks, maybe it would be six weeks. That is quite possible. But again, that is why we have gotten our most vulnerable populations, our older population, and our comorbidities in first so that we know if we are waiting a little bit longer that, that that'll be all right. Yeah, and we balance, and Brandon, I, I mean, that's a fair question because we talk about this. We talked with Dr. Fauci, uh, you know, we we're on a call with Dr. Fauci yesterday and Jeff Zients yesterday, and we were getting our report about what states would get. That's why I referenced it last night. Uh, or yesterday evening at 5.30 that earlier we had talked to this administration. And so we make our decisions based on the da data of the day. And after receiving that, we felt comfortable um, um, laying out our roadmap, updating our roadmap um, going forward. Kathy from the Ferdinand News. Good afternoon, Kathy. Good afternoon to both of you, too. Um, I have actually a couple of questions or maybe like two and a half questions. My, my first one is I still keep hearing from people that they don't want to get the shot because it will change their DNA, one. And um, the, the second part of that is not more people have died than would have died of the flu. So I would like, I would love to hear your answer to that. I know, I know, I hate even asking this, but I keep trying to defend that. And I thought, well, I'm just going to ask. Absolutely, Kathy. So first of all, the mRNA viruses never enter the nucleus of the cell. I mean, the mRNA vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell, which is where the DNA is. It only goes into the cytoplasm and works on a part of the cytoplasm called the ribosomes to make it make a protein that the, your body sees as foreign. And then your immune system gets fired up and makes antibodies and re responds to that. So there is no changing of your DNA. There's nothing permanently inserted into your cells. And, and I understand that that's a concern for people, but the, the science behind that does not support that. What's the second question? I was like, changes your DNA oh. and then Kath what was the that the number of people died. who have died or yes. would have been the same with the flu is kind of what's been indicated to me yeah. yes so you if you look and you can look on our website and see past deaths from influenza which would you know any be anywhere from a few hundred to a thousand or sixteen hundred deaths but honestly if you look at our, our overall deaths for last year preliminarily they're like around 77,000 and we usually average about 65,000 deaths. And that pretty much is right on par with the additional 12,000 deaths that we've had from COVID. And the CDC has done the same thing for the US and looking at that. So you can go to our website and see past deaths from influenza and they don't come anywhere close to the 12,000 plus deaths we've seen associated with thank, COVID. Thank you, I hope a lot of people heard that that keep making this point. My, my one other question, actually came from a reader who said 
you know, someone's been vaccinated and it's been, you know, the two weeks have passed and they're okay, but they're 80 to 95 and they're maybe visiting with someone who has also been vaccinated, who maybe works in a healthcare setting, should they still wear masks in that situation or are they pretty okay to be without it? So we worry more if they live in a congregate living setting uh, because we're more likely to have spread of infection there. But quite honestly, if this is two older friends getting together and they've both been vaccinated, I'm assuming they're, they don't sit right next to each other, but there's no reason they can't take their masks off, play bridge together, enjoy a nice lunch, celebrate all those holidays that they've missed together. I mean, that's part of this right, is that you get vaccinated so you can start to get back to those things that you love and the people that you love. And Kathy, if you rewind the tape uh, to, to Dr. Vox's first answer, the spell checker will catch all of her explanation. Oh. Of, uh, <laughs> a little drop of med school there. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be glad to write it out. It was thorough. <laughs> it was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Nikki? with WRTV. Good afternoon, Nikki. Good afternoon, Governor and Dr. Vox. Thanks so much uh, for taking our questions today. Mm -hmm. um, two quick questions, um, if you don't mind. One's yep. more of a logistics question uh, for Dr. Vox. The other um, is just a, a more of a general question. But the logistics question, for those that are age 16 to 17, Dr. Vox, do they have to have a parent or guardian permission to sign up to get the vaccine? And then the second question for both of you, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, realistically, when are we going to see every Hoosier? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but when will we see every Hoosier? What's the goal to get everyone who wants a vaccine actually fully vaccinated? Um, so when we look at get everyone fully vaccinated, um, if we talk about those 16 and older, I would love if we, you know, by June, we've got individuals that have everyone that wants to be vaccinated um, has been fully vaccinated. I will say that um, there will still be some hesitancy out there. There will still be some access issues and we'll be continuing to solve those over the summer. It looks like we'll be able to probably, based on the data and whether they get their emergency use authorization for it, that we will have some vaccines for kids ages 12 to 16 over the summertime and early fall. But the younger children, probably the last I heard from uh, Dr. Fauci was that that may be the first quarter of 2022. So we've got a ways to go there. Um, when we look at um, 16 and 17 year olds, um, they will need to sign up and make sure that they're looking at a site that's a Pfizer site because only mm -hmm. Pfizer has the EUA approval, the emergency use authorization approval for down to the age of 16. And our website will change in order to reflect that and remind 16 year olds that they need to look for a Pfizer site. Um, also, it will say when they go to sign up that they need to have a parent um, that um, will sign a consent form for them. So they could sign that consent form for the child or the child could bring that, that young adult, young whatever, <laughs> adolescent could bring that with them. Um, so we do not wanna put barriers up in front of 16 and 17 year olds to get their vaccine, but we do wanna be respectful of the fact that under 18, they would need someone to sign a parent or guardian. Steve with WNIN. Afternoon, Steve. Steve, you have to unmute your own microphone. Good afternoon. This question is for Dr. Box, please. Can you describe with as much specificity as possible the process that a dose of vaccine takes from the factory into the arm of someone here in Evansville? And is the same process used for disposables such as needles and syringes? Um. So we, we do have um, storage of vaccine all over the United States, um, and that is run by our Operation Warp Speed General Perna. Um, we basically have a given allocation every week to the state of Indiana of vaccine, and we can pull down from that allocation as much vaccine as we want. We try to make sure that that vaccine is um, already um, designated to go to specific sites so that the 
um, the centralized um, shipment uh, of that logistically will go directly to the site. So we're not trying to redistribute vac vaccine all across the state. Along with that vaccine comes um, some of the products that are needed to be able to administer that. So that would include uh, the different needles, um, alcohol wipes. Um, I do not believe it comes with the, the gloves, but the, the syringes to be able to administer it. Whitney Downard, CNHI. Afternoon, Whitney. Good afternoon. I've got two questions for you. Uh, my first question is that some immunosuppressed or at use, at risk Hoosiers who are under the age of 40 have told me that they're struggling to get their doctor referral process even after calling 211 multiple times. And that, you know, they're worried that they're going to have to fight with millions of other Hoosiers when availability opens up to everybody hmm. next week. You know, are they still going to have a priority path? for those who are at risk? Um, I think that that's a, a really good question. I do know though that there will be people that it may seem that they fall through the cracks on this. Most of our providers have been superb. I mean, we've about 150,000, over 150,000 people that have been referred to the portal. As, a, as I mentioned, when we get down to 40, that accounts for about 91% of individuals with um, comorbidities. So if that individual is having issues, say, with a specialty doctor that they see or their primary care, maybe they could reach out to the specialty physician or to their um, primary care uh, to get that referral into the portal. Dr. Sullivan, you want to add anything regarding 211 or otherwise? Yep. Absolutely happy to yep. do so. If an individual needs an additional referral, um, like uh, Dr. Box said, that can be from uh, any one of their providers. Individuals with disabilities are going through the same process and have that uh, referral entered through their case manager through Indiana Medicaid. 211 can see individuals see individuals once they've been added to the portal um, and they've gotten their uh, ticket um, for registration and uh, we'll continue to finalize that process for individuals with disabilities by the end of this week uh, to make sure that everyone has um, that priority access that you describe. Um, actually about 40 percent of individuals with disabilities um, are already eligible for vaccine by the age category. And so this is just an additional help for those individuals to receive priority access before uh, opening next week. So uh, definitely call 211. They'll be able to tell you whether you've been entered and help with registration. And if you've not been entered, then you'll know to call your doctor or case manager back um, to have that referral made. Okay. Uh, Whitney, you had a second question? Yes, sorry, I got yeah. remuted. Um, my second question Rachel. is, we're aiming for herd, human, herd immunity, but that definition varies from 80%, 70%, yep. 60%, yep. you know. Um, what's even realistic for us to expect in Indiana, and how is that going to be measured? Is that statewide or county or region? You know, what are we aiming for here, and how are we measuring that? <laughs> We're aiming for every Hoosier yeah. to get a vaccine that can, can safely do so. Uh, quite honestly, especially with the variants that we're seeing, I think it's really important that we don't get stuck on a, a basically kind of mythical number out there that it has to be 70% or 75% or 80 or 85%. And for me to say, oh, this this area is at 85%, so they're really good, we know that 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 boundaries don't occur. Basically, people travel from all parts of the state. So I, I really wouldn't be comfortable just saying, well, we're really good in this part of the state, but we're not good in this part of the state. I mean, it's, it's information and data that I use to make sure that I need to work on vaccine hesitancy there, work on vaccine access there, but not necessarily something that makes me comfortable uh, to say that uh, this area is okay and this area is not okay. So, so my goal is absolutely every Hoosier that's eligible for and um, from a medical standpoint can get a vaccine, gets a vaccine and potentially a booster in the yeah. fall. Yeah, for as long as this or a variant is with us, we need to have the capacity to care for the people that, that are in need of it. Eric with WIBC. Eric Berman. How are you? Eric Holko, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. <laughs> um, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, 
I noticed there is a slight difference in the slide that you put up in discussing the expansion of vaccinations versus what you said last night and today. The slide says that we plan to expand next week, um, subject, I assume, to availability. Yeah. The the Biden administration, their media reports saying that they're concerned Johnson & Johnson can't hit their targets. So what's the contingency plan? If we don't have the supply that we hope to have, does that just mean people wait longer and we don't schedule a Appointments, or do we scale back eligibility? Yeah, you honed in on my head, Jerry. <laughs> Very astute of you. Uh, yeah, that's what it means. I mean, I'm, this is why we track the supply and we try not to overpromise. Um, but we were comforted by the fact, and it's not just J and J. I mean, we got right. Our, we, we got increased doses right. of Pfizer this week. Moderna stayed pretty steady, but. Yeah. But we've made a lot of game time decisions in the yeah, past year, right. so it yeah. would be a, another game time decision. We we fully believe, though, that we're going to be able to go uh, open up completely to 16 above next week. Yep, we can handle the rush. Michael from WBEZ. Michael, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, Governor Holcomb, Dr. Box, and Dr. Sullivan. Now, uh, this past weekend, I finally had a chance to meet Dr. Box in person in Gary and conducted a. Uh, very informative interview, so thank you very much to her. She's a she's a huge celebrity up here. She's real. <laughs> she's real. Yes. Uh, Governor, I hate to put you on the spot with Fred Payne not being there, but I'm still hearing concerns from Northwest Indiana folks who are still facing months-long delays in getting unemployment claims processed. I know fraud has been an issue, but what is being done to help those who have been without work for nine months or more yeah. and are still awaiting unemployment claims to be processed? Yeah. Thank you. Yep, and I can I can have Fred, and I, I take this time to say that we'll be back here next Wednesday at 2.30. Um, I'm not punting this to Fred Payne by then, but I can make sure that Fred is here. But we look, Michael, we take this... We have to take this very seriously and we have to verify and make sure each individual case, and by the way, our unemployment, I mean, we'll get an update on Friday, but our, our unemployment continues to take down. So we'll make sure that folks who qualify and are eligible for those payments, the federal, our federal partners have, have you know, with this latest CARES Act 3, um, have also put more dollars there for the eligible. It's our job, the state's job, to verify um, each and every single case, and that's exactly what we do. So, um, send those send those folks our way if if there are um, examples that need an extra look. But I assure you, they are working around the clock to make sure that they bring that level down. And I can have Fred kind of give a wrap up next week. I'm I'm not suggesting that'll be our last press conference, by the way, but it could be because these are meant. Um, to provide news and we've we've given you a lot over the last 24 hours but we'll be able to we'll, we'll have more um, actions taken over the next week positive actions taken over the next week and more to report on Wednesday I know for sure but at some point obviously when we get kind of post April 6 if we stay on this trajectory and are indeed plateauing in the you know low three percentile range um, we may not we may not have one after April 6th. That's not to say that each agency won't continue to put out updates, whether it be DWD, Department of Workforce Development, or Department of Health, or FSSA, um, et cetera. Chris Johnston reporting on the budget, myself included, um, as, the, as the weeks and months ahead unfold. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb's next briefing will be next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m.